Let's open our Bibles to the second chapter in the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 2. And you know, when you look at these companies that make diet pills and exercise equipment and, and these kinds of things, they're very fond of using the whole before and after pictures, right? The before and after marketing ad campaigns. And there must be be some degree of worth there because they've been doing that as long as I can remember and probably you too. A number of years ago I read about a company I was discussing this with my wife the other day. They actually use pregnant women and they'd take a pregnant woman, eight, nine, ten months pregnant, sit her on a couch, take a picture of her, right? A few months later take another picture of her and you assume it's the diet pill or the exercise equipment that was responsible for the weight loss. Of course they never tell you about the kid that was born in between. But, uh, you know, just a super popular way that, that uh, uh, this culture has, has marketed uh, a number of its diet and exercise products. Well, what we have here in the second chapter in Ephesians is essentially the before and after picture of the advertisement of the gospel. That Paul is describing, this is what we look like before, and this then is what we look like now. This is what the gospel has done for us. Now again, in chapter 1, Paul unpacks for us in careful detail, this is who Jesus Christ is, this is who the Father is, this is what the Holy Spirit has done, this is the work of our triune God as it relates and concerns salvation. So Paul did that, and then he followed up that description essentially by saying, hey guys, this now is my supreme prayer for you. I am praying that you would get to know him, that you would know him intimately. Get yourself on that path of knowing him. And he said, guys, you do that. You set out to know God. Here's what's going hap- to happen. You're going to be enlightened. You're going to be illuminated. You will know hope. You will begin to access that power that is available to you and the promises of Christ and And man, it's just, you know, get to know God. All these things are going to happen. The very best counsel I will ever give you sitting from this chair will be this. Get to know God. Okay? Set yourself upon the path of discovering who he says he is in his word. Not not what we want him to be, but who he says he is in his word. All right? All right? The most important thing I will ever tell you from this chair is to get to know God, get to know him and his word. Because um, very simply, friends, the degree that you do that, the, the quality of your life now, the quality of your life throughout eternity simply depends upon how well you do that thing, how well you get to know God, all right? And again, the reason why it's so important we know him Review from last week, right? In life, there are going to be times when you've got a $5 problem, but you got 10 bucks in your pocket. You're going to weather the storm. Things are going to be fine. There are going to be other times, however, when you're going to be faced with a $5,000 problem and you don't have two nickels to rub together. And it is in that hour that you need to know who God is, that you need to know God's great love and God's great power and his compassion and his mercy in your life. Now, saying all that, reviewing last week, if you will, in order to set the stage for where where we find ourselves tonight. Before you can tell where his love and his mercy have taken us, we need to realize where it all began. All right? Before we can figure out how far the love and the promises of God have taken us, we need to know, where did we start from? Bobby gets on a train, heads west 70 miles an hour. How far did Bobby go? Well, we have no clue if we don't know where Bobby started from, right? What time did Bobby leave the station? What city did he leave from? And so forth. And so here, in the first three verses of chapter 2, Paul is going to inform you and I, as he is informing the Ephesians, where we started from. These first three verses in chapter 2 essentially mimic the first three chapters in the book of Romans. 
In those first three chapters, he is outlining, Paul is, the history of fallen men. He is giving the diagnosis for fallen humanity, if you will, before the cure is applied. Now, what he took three chapters to do in Romans, he is going to do now in three verses here at the top of chapter 2 in Ephesians. And he's going to talk about where man, where you and I and the believer have started, where we've come from. So guys, tune in here, because here's, here's the important concept that you need to lay a hold of. And it's, it's difficult to do with a lot of the, the stuff that's being peddled out there called teaching today. But unless we have a true understanding of our, tr- our, our, position, our, our position, our sin nature before God, unless we have a real understanding of our true condition before a holy God, without that, we will never come into a right appreciation of all that he is and all that he has done. Does that make sense? You know, there's a lot of soft sell on our sin nature these days and we don't like to preach about it and we don't like to talk about it and it is a great disservice being done within the body of Christ today because without understanding our true nature before a holy God, guess what? You're not, you're not going to need Christ. You're not going to need what he did. You're certainly not going to understand the degree to what he did, all right? So let's dig in then and begin now in verse 1 of chapter 2 and Shelley, let's just look at verse 1. Short but very thick. And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. All right. If you've got a good word-for-word translation, notice verse 1 starts with the words, and you. Okay. Now, this is interesting when you consider this in the light of the context of the end of the first chapter we just covered. There, you remember at the end of chapter 1, Christ is exalted. Everything, verse 22, right, is under his feet, and he's got power and he's got dominion and Paul's talking about oh God is so great and God is so awesome and you all right we've looked at God now we're going to look at you so here we go we're going to look at us underline that word dead okay when the Bible uses the word dead it uses it in the sense of separation it means separation in the Bible there are three different deaths that are spoken of in the scriptures. First of all, you've got physical death. That, of course, is the separation of the soul from the body. That's what you and I tend to think of when we hear this term death. Then you've got what Paul is talking about here, and that is spiritual death, and that is the separation of our souls from God. Right? Of course, far more significant than physical death. Spiritual death may or may not be temporary, as a function of whether or not we come to a saving knowledge of the Lord, right? And then there is a third type of death spoken in the scriptures. It's what the Bible calls the second death, and that is the soul's permanent separation from God, okay? The, the second, what, what the Bible calls the second death, primarily in the book of Revelation, uh, the, the second death is, is our soul being eternally separated from God. Not a good thing, Right? That's what we read about in the book of Revelation. Not a pretty place there. John, uh, the revelator, the, the author of the gospel we just studied, he tells us in Revelation 21, speaking of those who have rejected Christ, that their portion will be a lake that burns with fire and with sulfur. I don't know exactly what that means, but it sounds pretty rough, right? So death in the Bible means separation. If we reject Christ in this life, Our souls will be separated from God. That's spiritual death. When we physically die, our souls will be separated from our body. That's the physical death. And if we go to that physical death still rejecting Christ, then we will be separated from God from all of eternity. That is what the Bible calls the second death. So death, then, is a process of separation. Death is separation. Now, Before you and I came to the Lord, we were separated from God. And there are two reasons that we were separated from God, both of which are given here in verse 1. Let's go to the last one first. We were separated from God because of our sin. Underline that word sins at the end of the verse. That word sin, it means to miss the mark. Okay? It means to miss the mark 
It means to miss what it is that you were aiming for. The ancient Greeks would use this term to describe archers or spearmen missing their intended targets. Now today, we don't have a lot of archers or spearmen, do we? I mean, we're a very comfortable culture relative to those days, but we got a lot of dart players, right? So you're what, eight, nine feet away from the dartboard, and your desire is to what? Hit that bullseye, and you're taking careful aim, you know, and, 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 but somehow there's a flaw, there's a weakness in you, and you miss what it is you're aiming at. That's what this word means. Now, this lets us know that you can be a sinner without really meaning to be, right? I didn't want to hurt them. I, I didn't want to say the wrong thing. I didn't want to do the wrong thing. I was trying to be good. I was trying to aim at the target, but because of the weakness of who I am, I missed. And having missed now, I am a sinner. That's number one. Number two, back up a couple words, underline that word trespasses. You might have the word transgressions. You might have the word disobedience there. Some translations may use the term iniquity. Now, trespasses, this is a different animal altogether, guys, all right? A trespass is where God has drawn that deep line in the sand, you know where the boundary is at, you don't care one bit about that, and in an act of willful disobedience, you pick up your foot and you step over that line. You meant to do it. Sin is missing the mark, Trespass is willful disobedience. So sin then speaks of our failure, where trespasses speak of our rebellion. All right? So it is our failure and it is our rebellion that have separated us from God. Are you getting that? Okay? Now, there is a lot of bad theology about sin as I said, being promoted out there. We need to be very careful with this. It's very sneaky. It's very elusive. And it seeks to diminish the believer's understanding of his or her sin nature. And I want to protect you from this garbage. All right? That's part of my job here. Why this is dangerous is very, very simple. The degree to which we don't come to grips with our depravity, the degree to which we fail to recognize our sin nature... Jeremiah 17, right? The heart is desperately wicked. Who can can know it? All right? The degree to which we fail to recognize our sin nature is the degree to which you will lose your need for and appreciation of what Christ has actually done. All right? If you don't understand, if you don't come to grips with your own depravity before a holy God, you will miss the gospel. You will be a mildly inoculated religious Christian. And never really come into this worship of Christ because you don't see what he did, all right? You've got people that are out there promoting this idea that your sin is not the reason Christ came. That's happening today. We're being taught that today, all right? I'm going to call a little bit of that out today. And and I feel like uh, that's something that needs to be done, particularly in the community in which we find ourselves. So they say that sin isn't really the reason that Christ came and, you know, that if you're, believe, if you're sinning, you're just believing some lie about yourself. They promote this idea that you can actually be sinless. And, of course, like all false teaching, you have to throw out huge chunks of the scriptures to take those kinds of absurd positions. I saw a video this past week with my wife, a guy by the name of Chris Balaton, another one of these lunatics from out there in Bethel and Redding, California, He told his congregation he went a whole week without sinning. Deuteronomy 6, right? The Shema, re-quoted by Christ in Matthew 22. So, So, Mr. Valentine, you loved God with your whole mind and whole heart and all your strength and might for an entire week, every minute of every day for seven days? Again, John talking to believers in 1 John, he says that he who says he is without sin is deceived, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Okay? And so you've got all these sins of commission, things that we do, that we commit, commit. And then you've got 
sins of omission, all right? James tells us in chapter 4, hey, if you know what is good to do when you don't do it, that is sin. James 4, 17. So you've got sins of commission, you've got sins of omission. How in the world could a man of God, a purported man of God, get in front of his congregation and fill them with such garbage? I didn't sin for a week. Really? The truth is not in you, sir. All right? Unfortunately, a lot of people are buying this crap, and the end degree is when you begin to minimize, well, Christ didn't really come to die for your sin. He came for so much more than that. You know, whenever you begin to diminish what it is Christ came to do, you then begin to diminish the work of Christ. You shrink him in the hearts of these people that you're, you're pushing this false garbage to, all right? Now, again, it's not my intent to launch into an excursus upon false teaching, but for the fact that here we are covering it in these verses, got to speak to it to be faithful, okay? And the wonderful news is, we've already been delivered anyway from the penalty of every sin we've ever committed, are committing, and will commit. Why minimize what Christ has done? That's why we call this thing the gospel. The gospel is a term that means good news, all right? Since we're not covering the first three chapters of Romans, though, uh, by the way, that study is online at versexverse.com if anybody's interested to go deeper there. Uh, but since we're not covering that, summarized very succinctly here at the top of Ephesians 2, I want you, and, and because this is something we're, we're dealing with now in this community, not necessarily Three Rivers, but certainly Southwest Michigan, okay, um, I want you to be aware of the trap that the devil is sowing out there through these people. And the trap, guys... But I want you to be aware of, again, it's very simple. Christ came and paid for your sin at the cross. And if the enemy can do anything to dilute your understanding of your need for Christ, then he will have succeeded in diminishing the work of Christ and the importance of Christ and the necessity of Christ in your heart, you see. All right? Now, here then, very briefly, here's the proper theology of sin that the Word of God presents. Okay? Three words, guys. Penalty, power, presence. Penalty, power, presence. When Christ died for you upon that cross, he delivered you once and for all from the penalty of sin. We call that salvation. As the Holy Spirit is then dealing with you and maturing you and setting you apart, you are being delivered from the power of sin in your life. You are experiencing progressive victory over the influence of sin. And then one day, when you go to be with the Lord in eternity, you will be delivered from the presence of sin altogether, you see. That's what the Bible teaches. So you have been delivered, you have already been delivered from the penalty of sin. You are being delivered from the influence of sin. We call that sanctification. And one day you will be delivered from even the presence of sin. Make sense? All right, that's what the word of God puts forth. All right, well, let's notice then picking it up in verse 2, and let's look at just 2. In which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. <clears throat> okay, a lot about, there's a lot here. Underline that word walked, in which you formerly walked. That Greek word for walk, friends, means to meander. To meander, okay? It means to lack direction. It's the idea that you're just sort of floating over here and you're, you're bouncing around over there. And, and it could probably be described quite well by the difference between how I shop and how my wife shops, okay? Now, when I shop by myself, I have a mission, I have a direction. I've got a specific product in mind. I go into the store quickly, deliberately. I go to the aisle where the product is. I then extract that product, pay for it, and I'm out of there. Now, for my wife, shopping is more of an experience. Okay? And I know when she asks me, Honey, will you go shopping with me? I am in for an experience. All right, and so as we go in there disinfecting the shopping cart, I mean, we've got to have a germ-free experience, right? 
and I'm not sure what we're doing. I mean, we're looking at Christmas lights in July, for the love of God. We're looking at candles. Pretty soon I'm looking at shams. I don't even know what a sham is, all right? Uh, and she's typically very frugal. She can squeeze a penny so hard Lincoln screams, right? I mean, this lady buys furniture for 30 bucks, right? And that's part of the problem. I'm not paying four bucks for this. I can go down to the dollar store and get it for two bucks. So now I got to go down the road. Honey, you just go in there, go for it. I'll stay in the car. Oh, you just don't want to be with me. Ah! Now I got to go and have another experience. But there are people that, man, you get the point. Maybe a, a, not the best analogy there, but there are people that, man, they just meander about. They just float around in life, okay? And that floating is usually driven by what everybody else is into because notice here Paul says that they meander following the course of this world, underlying course of this world. It literally means a weather vane, all right? This phrase in the Greek is this phrase in the Greek means a weather vane. It refers to the idea of wind. That whatever direction the weather vane is pointed, whatever direction the wind is blowing, that is the direction they're headed into. And we see this in the world of fashion, right? It's like, dude, your hair, you can't do that. That's so last year. Or you can't wear those pants, man. That's so yesterday. That's so 90s. Now, the older you get, the more you realize things just sort of cycle in and out, right? So if you can leave the weight off, man, just keep your clothes because pretty soon they're going to be cool again, all right? I mean, you go into grandpa's closet, you're going to find something awesome in there. Now, Paul is telling us here that this wind is coming from the source. What's the source? The prince of the power of the air. Notice there in verse 2. The prince of the power of the air. This is one of the names that the Bible gives Satan. Those of you that were with us in John, you remember Christ called him the ruler of this world in John 14, John 16. And so what Jesus and Paul mean by these titles is simply that it is Satan who is ultimately driving this world system of rebelling against God, right? Paul is saying that it is ultimately Satan who works in, look at the end of the verse, the sons of disobedience there, okay? In other words, pretty simple, Satan seeks to influence the direction of this world, the weather vane of this world, and he does so, here's how he does it, by keeping men and women very busy with a variety of interests and distractions in order that they might be focused upon and obsessed with themselves, as he once was and never turned back, go read Isaiah 14, okay? Now, we typically think, (coughs) well, he wants to damn us with sex and drugs and rock and roll, right? But that's only one bullet in his arsenal. The enemy does not care what you are into, all right? The only thing he is interested in is that when you get to the end of your life, you look back and you realize there is not one dent that I've made as far as eternity is concerned. If you find yourself not having a real interest in God, which by default isn't true or you wouldn't be here for the most part, right? But if you find yourself hesitant to, to just get, just, just really get on board with God, maybe the problem, maybe the reason for the hesitancy is that, is that someone is just meandering in life and they're just going with the flow and they're allowing the weather vane of this age to dictate how it is that they choose to live. All right? This may explain some of your friends. Now, again, he started this chapter with, and you. Now, we had some fun with that, but the immediate context is he's talking, he was talking in verse 1 to Gentiles, okay? Non-Jews, you and me. All right? We were dead. We were diabolical. We were disobedient. Now, picking it up in verse 3, he concedes now that his people, Paul's saying, hey, the Jews too, were right there with you. Notice verse 3. Among whom also we all once conducted ourselves in the lusts of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, just as the others. Okay. Well, here, notice the pronoun switch. Did you see that? We had you in verse 1. Now we've got we 
there at the first part of verse 3, okay? So Paul is now including himself. Paul is saying that the Jews, just like the Gentiles, are born into sin. And though the Jews, you know, again, remember the audience here, Paul is saying that although these, these Jews might look like they're religious and they might look like they're right with God, in reality, they are just as deep in the mire as the Gentiles are in the muck. They are hopelessly lost. Now, friends, what the Word of God is telling us is that, look, everybody, okay, no matter what your, your ethnicity, no matter what your race, no matter how religious or churchy of an environment you were brought forth in, uh, you know, it doesn't, you know, no matter what your situation is, when you were born in this life, you were born a sinner, okay? David said in Psalm 51, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, there's a lot of people, they don't like that, all right? They like the idea that, well, how can a little baby have a sin nature? I mean, oh, they're so cute and they're just so innocent. The Bible says, look, they have been born with a sin nature. There was a time where we weren't so, uh, we, we did not as a culture feel such a need to be politically correct and, and, and ill offensive, okay? But listen to this. This was not that time. Let's go back to 1926. The then governor of Minnesota commissioned a task force called the Minnesota Crime Commission. This is the one of the things that they wrote a 77-page report. This is one of the things that the Minnesota Crime Commission had to say concerning root causes. Maybe some of you can identify. This is the Minnesota Crime Commission. Every baby starts out as a little savage. He is completely selfish and self-centered. He wants what he wants, when he wants it, his bottle, his mother's attention, his playmate's toys, his uncle's watch, or whatever. Deny him these things, and he rages with an aggressiveness which would be murderous were he not so helpless. He is dirty, he has no morals, no knowledge, no developed skills. This means that all children, not just certain children, but all children are born delinquent. And if permitted to continue in their self-centered world of infancy, given free reign to their impulsive actions to satisfy each want, every child would grow up a criminal, a thief, a killer, a rapist. We were born with a sin nature. Now, we spend billions of dollars today relabeling everything, all right? I mean, every month we've got some new sickness or disease, and of course, the pharmaceutical companies happen to have a new drug for it, right? Now, you can put the label of whole milk on rat poison if you want, but I'm telling you, don't dunk your Oreos in it. You're going to get sick, okay? We relabel. Look, it doesn't matter. Put any kind of label on it you want, man. Sin is still sin. That's the point I'm trying to make. Was the Minnesota Crime Commission a little bit harsh? Yeah, maybe. But the point is, is what we're trying to, to, to look at here, okay? Any attempt by certain individuals on the, within the body of Christ to try and minimize what sin is is ultimately going to diminish the depths of what Christ has accomplished in your heart. What Paul is saying here is whether you're Jew or Gentile, we all begin, look, we all begin in the same place, and that is we are dominated by our sin nature. And guys, I'm telling you, to the degree to which you are in denial of that, I'll I'll tell you flat out, that's the degree to which you're not going to appreciate Christ. It's that simple. Okay? All right, but that's where we began. The good news, though, now picking it up in verse 4, is where we end up, and let's look at 4 through 6. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Okay, well, you know what? At the beginning of verse 4, those might just be the two most important words in Scripture. After Paul summarizes in great brevity the hopeless condition of man, verse 4 chimes right in with, but God. Right? I mean, if it were not for that, but God, we would be hopelessly lost, separated from God, dead in our sin. 
Let's break it down. Underline that word mercy, all right? Underline that word mercy in verse four. God being rich in mercy, okay? Now that word mercy means not to receive what you deserve. God spares us from justice, essentially. Grace is kind of its counterpart. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. And, and boy, is, is God ever abundant in that, is, is serving that up as well. And so that's the simple difference between mercy and grace, guys. Grace is getting, grace is getting what shouldn't come to you, and mercy is not getting what should come to you, okay? That is how the Bible defines those two terms. In other words, mercy, which is in view here in verse 4, is not receiving justice, okay? We never pray for justice as believers, do we? I mean, we never go to God and say, God, give me what I, what I deserve, right? I mean, why would we do that? We never pray, but we pray for mercy. Now, notice it says, not only is our, our but God, not only is he rich in mercy, but he's also, keep reading, great in his love. Now, again, when did he love us? When? Paul tells us here, while we were still dead, before we were made alive. Again, speaking of spiritual death, being made alive. He tells us the same thing in Romans. Romans 5, 8, right? You've heard this verse. God demonstrated his love towards us, and while we were still uh, sinners, Christ died for us. You know that verse. Now, all the theology aside here, I, I want you to get this in your heart. That, that I want, what does this mean? What is this to look like in our hearts? I want you to, to grab onto this personally for your relationship with him. What does this mean God loved us while we were still dead? Kind of a deal, all right? Well, it means that before we could do one good thing, before we could do any righteous act, God loved us and initiated this plan of salvation for us. And guys, to me, this is where the rubber hits the road. He loved us before we were lovable, all right? He loved us while we were still self-centered idiots. He loved us in the midst of our mocking him with our lives. This is what I want you to see. This is where the rubber hits the road. Listen, him loving us in that condition had to have been and was, in fact, a sovereign act of choice on his part. He decided out of his own free will that he would love us when we were that way. All right, well, what do you mean? It's like this. Imagine you're late for work, you're speeding, you're going through a school zone, and you hit a small child going to school, and you kill that child. You'll go to jail for a period of time, no doubt, no doubt. You'll pay some fines. Now, after you've put in your time and after you've paid all the money, the state's going to come to you and the state is going to say, we don't have any more against you. You're free to go, all right? But what about the parents of the child that you killed? No amount of money, no amount of jail time is going to bring their baby back to them. And so if they, here's what I'm driving at, if they are ever to, re, if you are ever to receive the parent's forgiveness, if you are ever to receive their love, it has to be something that they bring forth out of their own sovereign will. Right? You starting to see this, some of you? No, you've killed their child. Think of how difficult that would be to, for, for those parents to choose to love someone who had offended or hurt you so deeply. The only way that will happen is by a sovereign act of choice on the parent's part. Again, think of how difficult that would be. Now, multiply that literally across billions of souls over the course of the ages, multiply that pain exponentially across the entire chasm of, of human history, that's what God has done for us. That's what I want you to see. He has sovereignly chosen to love the unlovable. He knew before he sent his son that we would kill his child. Then he sent him anyway. I want more than theology just to come off these pages. Man, I want you to get it in here because that's where it matters. All right? Remember, the Bible tells us that before we were created, it was already determined that Christ would die for the ungodly, right? And so here's God and the councils of eternity passed somewhere, somehow forming us out of the clay of the ground. Why did he do it? I mean... 
That's the question. If God knew that we were going to end up being ungodly, if he knew at some point we would swerve into ungodliness, why in the world did he bring us forth in the first place? Q verse 7, here's the reason. Shelley, let's look at verse 7. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Oh, there it is. We will be the evidence that God is going to use through all of eternity that he is a God of love, that he is a God of grace, and a God of mercy. We are going to be God's exhibit A, if you will. That of creation that has already been created or creation that has yet to to be created, if from any corner of the universe the accusation is ever brought before the throne of God saying, you're not love, God is going to point to you and I and say, well, what are you going to tell me about these guys here? Right? I mean, tell me I'm not love and I'm not grace and I'm not... Explain to me what these guys are doing here. Okay? Throughout the ages to come, throughout the councils of eternity and beyond, we are going to be the evidence that demonstrates that he is a God of great love and a God of great mercy. Come on. Now it is an act of obedience to think upon the things of of eternity. It is an act of obedience. Paul tells us in Colossians 3, hey, Think about things above. Think about the eternal realm, not about the things on this earth. You want to think about eternity in light of this truth that the word of God is putting forth here in verse 7? Listen to this. If you want to know what eternity is going to be, eternity is going to be the Lord just piling on top of us, blessing after blessing after blessing. So throughout the ages to come, All of the heavenly hosts in in the universe will understand that this God is a God of great love. And of course, it is all based upon grace. Notice what he says in verse 8. Let's look at verse 8 and verse 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Okay. Okay. There it is. The word of God is telling us, guys, as clearly as possible, all right? It doesn't get much clearer than Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. We are not saved by anything that we do, all right? But by what Christ has done. Throughout any good Bible study, your teacher should be taking you back to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9 from time to time. Here we are. We are not saved by anything that you and I do. We are saved by what Christ has done. All right? Now, notice further there, though, that Paul is telling us here that even our faith is a gift of God. You see that at the end of verse 8? Not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Even our faith. So even the measure of faith that caused you to choose Christ was a gift from God. Do you understand that? You see, God has devised a way of salvation that none of us could ever take any credit for. It's just Jesus, man. It's not Jesus plus what you and I can add to the equation, right? Well, it's Jesus and I'm kind of a pretty good guy. That doesn't have nothing to do with it. You know, it's, it's just... It's just Jesus, man. And that should cause you, a real understanding of that should cause you just tremendous rest. You don't have to strive. You don't have to keep some spiritual checklist. You don't have to do your, you know, Santa Claus spiritual list and check it twice for this week. Your your joy in the Lord does not have to rise and fall upon your uh, inconsistent performance as a, as a Christian because it's all about what he has done that should cause us great rest we don't have to sweat in the energies of the flesh we don't have to strive you can just rest in what he has done that's why Christ said hey if you are weary and heavy laden man come to me and rest alright 
Now, because the right understanding should help you to internalize that you don't have to keep some spiritual to-do list. That's religion, right? The right understanding, understanding that you don't have to do that. Man, now you're just free to pursue and love him. You don't have to perform for him. You're not a circus monkey. You're free to just love God. He's done all the work. And you see, what happens is we want to get on this this religious treadmill and we want to get over here and do all this stuff thinking that that's going to somehow get us closer to God and it's not, it's just going to embroil you in, in your own inconsistency. But we're, forget about all that. It's done, now go and love him. And then if you do that, instead of going that way, you just go and pursue him and love him and you fall in love with him. Hey man, all that other stuff's going to be in tow. All those other activities that that before you were doing to try and be some kind of, earn some kind of standing before God or or be some kind of a spiritual person. No, 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 no. That's religion. It's all done. Go and pursue him. Fall in love with him. Get to know him. You will be changed by your love for him. That's the only authentic agent of change that the Bible offers is your love for Christ, okay? Anything else is religion. In fact, I am convinced the easiest way for a person to end up in hell is to try and earn their way to heaven. I believe that heaven is uh, hell. I believe that hell is going to be heavily populated with very religious people. God here tells us he has devised a way that we can get no credit. It's all predicated upon his grace and thank God. Now, we want to create our little church rules We want to do what we believe are good things so that we can feel better about ourselves. But when we begin to create all these little church rules, two things happen. Number one, we stop glorifying God. And number two, we look stupid. In some of the churches of Christ, I don't know if you know this, but it's illegal to hum in church. Somebody somewhere down the line evidently read that verse, you know, every tongue shall confess. And so the exaltation of God involves the movement of the tongue. And when you are hum, your tongue just sort of sits there. And so if you come in here and you're trying to exalt my Jesus and you're not moving your tongue, you are going to be run out of here on a rail. We don't want any humming going on. And so the churches just look so good dumb and foolish throughout the ages because we want to come up with all these kooky ideas of of what constitutes spirituality. Now again, we're saved by grace. So does that then mean we just do whatever we want to do? No, it does not. And Paul said in Romans 6, by no means, you know, how can we who died to sin, still live in it. The deal is this. If you come to a real saving knowledge of Christ, if you respond to his pursuit of you by pursuing him in return, you're getting in his word, you're getting to know him, you're coming to a deep and profound awe of who he is, there's no way you can remain who you are. You will be transformed. So we got to understand there's a couple things going on here. Salvation and then after salvation. But as far as salvation is concerned, guys, there's nothing that you can add to that equation. We are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anybody boast. Okay? Now, understand. Now you're a Christian. Now you're saved. Having been saved... Part of that transformation now is putting the ways of the flesh to death. And this is where we don't want to take this great grace and get cheap with it as believers, okay? Christ is not calling us to be separated. We talked about separation. Christ is not calling us to be separated, to be set apart in order to get to heaven because, again, the work of salvation is his alone. The process of Christ calling us to be set apart is not in order that we would be saved. We're already saved, but he is calling us to be separate in order that now, having saved us, he can begin to transform us into his image, all right? Remember that Christ said if we're to be his disciple, we are to what? 
deny ourselves, take up our cross and follow him, Luke 9, 23. The word of God tells us that having been saved now, nothing of our own, okay, all Christ, but having been saved now, the word of God tells us that we are to put our flesh nature to death. Now again, what does death mean? It means separation. If you want to be a disciple of Christ, you have to be actively separating yourself from your flesh nature. That's what discipleship is. Discipleship is a lifelong process, whether you're saved two years, 20 years, 40 years, all right? But every day you are further separating yourself from the influences of your fallen nature. Now, if that process is not going on, you are not a disciple of Christ. I could be a church person, I could be saved. I might even be one of those that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians 3, kind of coming out of the other side of that rewards bench, a little bit toasty, a little smoky, right? Saved, but there's one barely escaping the flames, right? I could be one of those guys. I might even give to worthy causes. But I am not a disciple of Christ if I am not continuing to seek to challenge my flesh nature. Okay? Now, finally in verse 10 then, this is how it all comes about. And this is a verse that we should all commit to memory. And I'll read this here. Uh, Verse 10, for we are his workmanship. Underline that, all right? Created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. So we're going to close with verse 10 here. By the way, this is your memory verse uh, on your study guides. Underline that word, workmanship. This is beautiful. You might have the word masterpiece in your translation. If you have an NIV, you've got the word handiwork there that doesn't even come close to capturing what's going on here. This word for workmanship in the Greek it is the word, it is the Greek word poema. Okay, it's where we get our word poem from. All right? It has the idea of a work of art. Now, when you are reading a poem, you, when you're, you're looking at a picture or a sculpture or whatever, what you are looking at is something that an artist has used to express his or her mind, right? There's something that they want you to see. There's a concept that they are, are perceiving in their hearts that they, they want the rest of us to understand. And so they take their thoughts, they take their heart, and they put it into their poem or painting or music or whatever. Here's what Paul is saying. You were dead in your sin, He has now made us alive completely through his sacrifice. And now he is working a process where you are his work of art. You are his poem, all right? You are his workmanship. He is trying, the mind of God, God is trying to reveal his mind and his heart to the rest of humanity through you and I. We are his poem, his work of art, his workmanship. Now ask yourself in the quietness of your hearts this week, whose workmanship am I? Now the psychologists, they say, well, you're the workmanship of your perverted uncle that molested you when you were five years old, or or you're the workmanship of that unfaithful, unloving first husband of yours that walked out the door, or or you're the workmanship of that idiot father that left when you were eight. You know, they try and tell us that what you are today is defined by everything that we have gone through in life. Maybe that's true for the unbeliever, I don't know. But what I do know is this, that is not true for the Christian. For you and for me, it is the love of God and the power of God that has come into our life and now we have become his workmanship. I'm not the workmanship of some perverted family member of years gone by. I am now the workmanship of a loving, gracious, merciful God who wants to express himself through me. All right? So this is the choice that we have, guys, at the end of the day. This is the choice. There are two of them. You can either meander through life or you can become his workmanship. These are the two paths that you can be on. You can just meander through life and allow the weather vane and the winds of this world to blow you where they may. Two things are going to happen there. You're either going to end up drifting away or you're going to have a very limited Christian experience. Or 
you can be on that path of new life where God is continuing to try and breathe into you new life every single day, all right? And, and you're well aware, you, you've become aware of your true condition, your true sin nature before God. You've become, you're in touch with that. And because of that, you marvel at his saving work in your life that he chose to love the unlovable. And you're just watching this work of art. You're watching this poema take place. And you're not sitting on the couch, but you're joining God on that battlefield of transformation. And you're challenging your flesh nature not to be saved, because you're already saved, but you're challenging your flesh nature to cooperate with God, allowing him to continue just this beautiful work of art that is you making you into the person he desires you to be and that he has designed you to be. You are his trophy of grace. We learned last week, you are his inheritance, all right? You are his evidence to the universe that he is love. And man, I don't know about you, but the choice to me seems to be pretty easy. Choose not the path of this world. Choose not the winds of despair and boredom and mediocrity and ultimately base stupidity. But choose the author of light and life. Choose purpose and hope and wisdom and peace and watch these things grow in you as you cooperate with him, him transforming you into this beautiful work of art that you already are and will be. God sees you from his eternal eyes as already having completed that process, okay? Guys, I'm just gonna keep getting back to this every week, week in and week out, all right? We have got to set ourselves upon the path of knowing this God and discovering who he says he is. Let us not go to the word of God to support our preconceived ideas, but rather let's allow our ideas to be corrected and clarified by the word of God. That's how you grow. Don't pick and choose those things that align with what you've been taught. You will stagnate and you will lack wonder and you will lack awe. Go to the word of God saying, God, search my heart, correct my thinking, cause me to grow. I want to know you. I want to really know who you are. You do that, friends. You'll never, ever be the same. It's such a simple choice. Don't get caught up in religion. Don't get caught up in just sticking to your preconceived ideas and your guns and what you've been taught. Go to the word of God fresh every day, every week, Teach me, Lord. You are his work of art. You have the choice to cooperate with that. May you do that this week. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you that your word is so good. Time and time again, we go to your word and we are enriched. Lord, I I pray that, that, God, you would cause us to see who we really are before you, not in order to feel bad about ourselves, not in some guilt sort of way. Your word says there's no condemnation in Christ. But God, just just help us to appreciate our, our true condition before you so we can marvel at what your son has done. We want to know you, God, and we want to know ourselves, and we want to know the difference that we might marvel at and worship and be in awe of who you are. God, I pray that you would just continue to put a hunger in the hearts of these men and women to get to know you throughout the week, every day, to spend some time with you and just seek to know you and know that peace and that joy that that your word says surpasses all understanding. God, we just love you. We ask these things because even our faith is a gift from your son. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. All right.